In this video, I'm going to talk to you about how multiple sclerosis specialists use MS medicines incorrectly on purpose. Don't turn away because that starts right now. Hey! Howdy! Thanks for learning about MS with me, Aaron Boster. I started this YouTube channel to help my own MS clinic patients learn between visits, and it's my hope that through these videos, I can help you learn too. Today, I want to discuss MS disease modifying therapies, medicines that we use to slow the course of this nasty disease. So when the FDA approves a drug, and this is important to talk about, they look at all of the data collected. So all the phase one, the phase two, the phase three data, they collect it all. Literally, it will fill a semi-truck. And from those clinical trials experiences, they will craft a label. And the label clarifies how the FDA thinks this drug should be administered and how this drug should be monitored. And it's based on the data from the clinical trial. So to use an example, if we tested a drug in a clinical trial infused in your arm every 28 days, when the drug is finally FDA approved, it will be approved to be given every 28 days. That's on-label use. In this video, I'm gonna be talking to you about off-label use when MS neurologists purposefully use the medicine different from the way it's recommended in the label. Not because we're cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, but because there's scientific or medical rationale for why that might be a good idea. Of course, a quick disclaimer, this video is for educational purposes only. I am most certainly not telling you to change how you take your MS medicine. I just wanted to share with you some of the clinical practice of off-label use. If something here is of interest to you or sounds weird, it might spur a conversation with your MS neurologist. But nothing I say here should trump what you and they are doing to, for your care. This is just for education. Please keep that in mind. The first drug I'd like to talk about is Copaxone, glutamor acetate. So Copaxone has been around and FDA approved since the 90s. It was first approved as a 20 milligram injection in a one cc of fluid given once daily under the skin. And for a long time, that's how Copaxone was given. I trained under a great man. Uh, my mentor was named Omar Azar Khan. Uh, he was an MS neurologist at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. And I spent two years under his tutelage and fellowship. Now, the reason I bring that up is Dr. Khan used a tremendous amount of Copaxone. He started almost every single patient on Copaxone uh, when he first diagnosed them and I followed literally thousands of people who were on Copaxone. What Omar found was it was not necessary to give the drug every single day. And he believed that if you had been on it for a little bit, you could start to use it less often. Now, Dr. Khan was quite a researcher and he did a clinical trial on his own, which he called the GOD trial, G-O-D, Glutaramor every other day, so G-O-D. And in his uh, own clinic, we gave people, through a approved clinical trial, this wasn't like some garage experiment, we gave people 20 milligrams of Copaxone every other day. And what we found was it made no lick of difference in how the people did. They did just as well when we followed them on MRI and on clinical evidence as the people that were taking it all the time. Now, interestingly, Omar went on to develop the three times a week 40 milligram dose of Copaxone, which is currently FDA approved. But if you looked at his clinical practice, that's not what he was doing. We were giving people Copaxone much less often than that. What? We were giving people in some cases Copaxone 20 milligrams once a week. The thought process here is when you think about what Copaxone does, it tolerizes the peripheral immune system so it no longer gets terribly excited and inflammatory when it sees myelin. When you give Copaxone daily, or even three times a week, you keep showing the immune system its target. And then the thought process that Omar had was, once we get the immune system tolerized, we don't need a daily or a constant reminder. We might be able to do it as infrequently as once a week. Point here is there are MS neurologists around that even today continue to use Copaxone, an ancient arcane medicine. But oftentimes I find they may tweak how they use it and they may give it less frequently. The next drug I like to discuss is Gelidia, or Fingolimod, and this is a once daily pill. Now, the way the medicine works is by trapping about 80% of your white blood cells in your lymph nodes. 
And so if you trap them in the lymph nodes, they can't circulate in the bloodstream. And if they can't circulate in the bloodstream, they can't cross the blood-brain barrier to get into the central compartment where they could attack brain and spinal cord. And so when you take gelinia, you cause a change in your white blood cells, which make them get stuck in the lymph nodes until you stop taking gelinia. And this, by the way, is true for the other uh, S1P receptors, the gelinia Me2 drugs, Mazent, Ponvori, uh, and Zyposia. Now, when you take these medicines this way, the white blood cell count will drop. When you check blood, the white blood cell count is low. And it's not low because we killed all the cells, it's because we stuck most of them in the lymph nodes. And there are some concerns by some doctors that if you do a, a daily suppression like that, it might be too much and you might increase the risk of an infection. And so there are some MS neurologists that opt to give gelinia every other day. Now, I do not agree with this, and I actually think there's some literature to suggest it's a bad idea, but the rationale is if we give someone gelinia every other day, well then you don't suppress the cells, you don't trap them as much, and you might allow just a little more to come out and circulate. And so for those doctors, they're hopeful that might be a better risk-benefit balance. So, Hey, real quick before we go on. If you like this video, would you give it a thumbs up? Also, if you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please consider doing so. Thank you. Next up is Tysabri, or natalizumab. Now, Tysabri is an infused drug in the vein, a high-efficacy monoclonal antibody, which was FDA-approved to be taken every 28 days. And they're very specific. You can't give it closer, but you can't give it farther apart. Now, there's one major risk with Tysabri, and that's the infection PML. And in order to develop the PML infection, you have to contract the JC virus. So that's one risk factor. And then the longer you're on Tysabri is another risk factor. Now, there are some others that I'm not going to talk about in this lecture. But what we have found is that you can give Tysabri less frequently. You can give Tysabri every five or six weeks, and it does not seem to increase the risk of attack. And it does seem to lower the risk of PML. And so after a really big investigation done by a bunch of my friends, uh, MS investigators, they clarified this. They found that if they gave people every five or six weeks, it seemed to be safer without increased risk. Now, subsequent to that, there's been one paper that came out that suggested there may be some breakthrough uh, MRI activity when you space the dose out. But I still think the vast majority of MS neurologists, myself included, will consider extending the dosing interval, giving Tysabri every five weeks or every six weeks, particularly in a patient who is JC virus antibody positive to mitigate risk. This might be one of the best examples of intelligently thinking through the way a drug works and using it off label for the betterment of the human being. Next up, let's talk about ocrelizumab. Ocrelizumab ocrevis, it's an outstanding medicine, highly effective, and it's an infusion in the vein every six months. And it's approved for MS, both relapsing MS and progressive MS. Now, before Ocrevus came out, there was another anti-CD20 that's been used, approved for cancer and other rheumatologic diseases, not approved to be used in MS, but used in MS all the time, and that's called rituximab or rituxan. There are even big MS centers around the world that preferentially will use rituxan, but it is not FDA approved. And interestingly, the drugs aren't exactly the same. And rituximab is an effective MS medicine, even though it's not FDA approved and there isn't as much evidence for its use compared to okra. Next, let's quickly talk about Kisemta. So Kisemta is ufatumumab and it's FDA approved as a self-injection. Ufatumumab, however, was already in existence in an intravenous form used for cancers. And so theoretically, the intravenous form of Kisemta might work just as well as the shot, but only the shot is FDA approved. Limtrada is one of my favorite MS drugs from an efficacy standpoint. It's super, super effective. It's also really, really complex. It's given as an infusion in the vein for five consecutive days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Then you wait a year, and then you give it for three consecutive days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And so that's the way the American label recommends using it. But I've seen MS doctors do all kinds of things with the dosing schedule. There are some MS doctors, friends of mine, that will preferentially give the drug Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then they give the patient Saturday and Sunday to recover, and then they finish Monday, Tuesday. So they give the five doses, but they bridge a weekend to give the patient time to catch their breath, so to speak. 
And that's pretty interesting. Now, I've never done that on purpose, but I have had situations for other reasons why during the five days we had to have a pause. And I can tell you that it's made no difference in how the patients have done, but that is an off-label use of this medicine. When we go back to the dosing schedule, five days, wait a year, three days, I have had situations where we do five days, wait, oh, wait a second, we got pregnant, ah, and then we have a baby, and then we breastfeed, and then we take the next dose. And fortunately, that hasn't happened very often in my clinic, but it has happened a few times, and that's an off-label schedule, and it's worked out just fine. And mom and baby have done great. Next on the list is Mavenclad, or cladarine tablets. And Mavenclad is FDA approved as a pill for MS. Now, cladribine, that's the generic, cladribine is actually approved for other conditions, for cancers, and it's been used subcutaneously under the skin or intravenously. And those formulations are available, but not approved for MS. If you look at my friends at the Barts Center in London who use a lot of cladribine, they have a protocol to give it subcutaneously. And I don't believe that in the UK, just like here in the United States, I don't think it's approved for that use, so that's an off-label use. I also want to share that the dosing schedule of Mavenclad is to give five days the first month, wait a month, five days the second month, wait a year. And before you start the second year, you need to check some uh, counts to make sure the white blood cells have come back up. And if they haven't come back up, the label says six months later, go ahead and give them the Mavenclad. Well, I can share with you anecdotally that there are situations where we've opted not to give the Mavenclad until the cells fully come back. And in one extremely rare instance, a patient took Mavenclad. A year later, their counts were still really low. And so the clinician waited and waited and waited and waited until they came up and waited a full extra year. So Mavenclad once, and then two years later, Mavenclad again. That's off-label. The patient was followed very carefully clinically and with uh, labs, and they did outstanding. They had no disease activity, and that's a great example of the off-label use of a medicine trying to better balance risk benefit for the human being. Next, I'd like to talk about Abagio. So Abagio is a daily pill approved for MS, and the generic name is teraflunamide. Now this gets really interesting. There's a different drug approved for rheumatoid arthritis. The trade name is Arava here in the United States, and the generic name is Laflunamide. Now interestingly, when you take Laflunamide, Arava, and you put it in your mouth, and it goes in your stomach, it metabolizes. And the very first metabolite, literally, leflunamide turns into teraflunamide. And it works just the same once it turns into leflunamide, as best we can tell. And so, it is off-label to treat someone with MS with generic Arava, but it's very, very inexpensive and should work just as well as Abagio. The most impactful thing you could do to help this channel grow is to watch another video. So if you want to continue to up your game, click the video that's on your screen right now. And until my next Monday morning vid, or even better yet, until the next time I see you at the Boster Center for MS, this is Aaron Boster saying be safe and take care.